All right, let's put the captions on. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Skype a Scientist Live. Today, we are joined by Carissa Turner. Carissa is a wildlife biologist and knows so much about so many animals. Um, I've been following Carissa on social media for years and learned all sorts of things about many different critters and how we shouldn't touch most of them. Uh, you know, it's mostly a bad idea to touch a wild animal. Um, and we'll be talking all about that today. So um, Chris is going to say uh, who she is, what she does, why she likes it. And then uh, we'll be all talking about your questions. So as you have questions today, please submit them to the Q&A. We, we want to answer what you want to know. Um, other housekeeping notes, um, we'll be doing one more of these this semester. The next one is going to be on uh, physics. Um, you can always find out what we're up to um, on our website, skypeascientist.com. It's going to be uh, on December 13th, again, at 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Carissa. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carissa Turner. I have a master's in wildlife biology and environmental science. I started um, in Tennessee, and I've done a lot of work in Tennessee with bats and armadillos, which are moving from Florida and Texas up north. So that was an interesting study. Uh, I've done some work in Wyoming and Nevada with endangered um, black-footed ferrets and pygmy rabbits. So I've been all over. Um, I love traveling. Uh, it's a little difficult. You have to leave home and everything you know, but it's exciting to see new places, new animals, and meet cool people that also love working on wildlife and the environment. Um, my main interest is mammals, but I also really like herps, you know, turtles and reptiles and frogs and um, plants, birds, everything. So I know a little bit about everything, but my main interest is mammals. So that's the main reason I love it, seeing things that not everybody gets to see. I do a lot of photography as well, so I like to take photos of what I see and post them online to share with everybody. So I'm happy to share um, all I know with people here too today. Awesome. So in your work, how much of your time is spent outside and how much of your time is spent like in an office or a laboratory? Right. So I haven't done a lot of lab work. Um, I'm not really into genetics and things. Uh, I have friends that do that. That is a big part of wildlife biology. We have to study for diseases and things like that in the lab. Um, but the main thing I do is hands-on work with mammals. We go trap them. We'll put, you know, radio collars on them. Like you see bears or deer with the tracking collars. We do that with smaller mammals, like little pygmy rabbits that weigh about a pound. <laughs> um, and I like doing the field work, but I have done um, about 50% of my work um, in the office on computers looking at maps and movement of animals, because of course, when we get that data from the collars and track them, we have to look at that on a map. So a little bit of computer work as well. Um, it depends on what job you do. There are field jobs where it's 100% in the field. And then there's things like research where you're doing 50-50 field work and computer work. So a lot of options in this field though. Great. Um, oh, all right, Jasmine's here. Excellent. Um, Everyone, if you have questions at home, please submit them to the Q&A. Um, normally we have a zillion questions, so uh, feel free to get those in. So of um, the animals you've worked with, so, okay, you mentioned that um, you work with mammals a lot, but you also work with herps um, and then listed off a bunch of reptiles. What is a herp and why do we call reptiles herps? So herps would be reptiles and amphibians. So reptiles are your snakes, turtles, tortoises lizards, and then amphibians, of course, frogs, uh, salamanders, newts, things like that. And I haven't done um, any paid work with them, but I do go survey on my own because I just like to go look at them. And I want to get more experience in that in the future, just going and looking for turtles. I have friends who study um, desert tortoises, so in near Death Valley and things. So that's also a very cool job for people who want to do that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. We've got a question from Oaks High School. Uh, what is your most favorite animal? My goodness, that is a hard choice. Um, there's so many neat animals out there. There's things a lot of people have never heard of in different uh, continents they haven't been to. Uh, but my favorite would probably be a river otter or a mink. So little weasels or weasel type animals that are related to weasels that live in the water are probably my favorite. <laughs> 
Very cool. All right. We've got a question from Gia. What would you say is your most significant finding with the mammals that you work with? So the neatest thing I've done so far is studying armadillos in Tennessee. Um, as I said a few minutes ago, they weren't really found there. Um, they were found in West Tennessee near the Mississippi, so where it was really, really warm. And then in the last 10 years, they have moved to take over all of Tennessee, so a big range expansion. So um, people know them from Florida, Texas. They think of them as a desert animal, um, nine-banded armadillos. And then, yeah, in the last 10, 20 years, they moved up to Illinois. They might hit, you know, Pennsylvania um, in the future. <laughs> um it may be due to climate change or it may just be that they were always going to be there and it just took time for them to get there. Um, but people think of them as a desert animal and they actually, we have found they like, they like water a lot. So we see them a lot near rivers and things. So um, I got to study that and see, I was one of the first people to see how they moved across Tennessee and um, how long that took to happen. So it was neat to be the first one to really look at them there and see what kind of habitats they were in near the water there. <laughs> Super cool. Uh, thank you for that. All right. Our next question comes from Melanie. How can individuals contribute to wildlife conservation efforts in their daily lives? Um, so the big thing a lot of us talk about is um, not mowing our yards or keeping the place clean. So if you have a way to safely remove trash from areas, you go hike in, walk in, um, get gloves, get some buddies, go um, clean up areas and then also if you have a yard and you can maybe go a little bit longer before mowing it again that helps you know pollinators and things um, another thing is just learning what you can get some books and um, there's a lot of free materials online to uh, learn all you can about the animals around you I mean a lot of people don't even know the birds in their backyard so learn those things learn how to help them and learn what you're interested in interested in and what's around you because obviously it's very specific to where you live totally yeah local knowledge is so super helpful when making these decisions um and there are also groups like in your area like often like here in philadelphia we've got um like a a naturalists program that you can take so you can get help learning all of this stuff um that can be really really helpful too so uh the next question comes from uh laura uh, from Justin, how do you choose what organisms you'll study? So a big part of that is what do we not know? So as a scientist, we go and we see what questions are answered and what things we don't know about yet. So I worked with the pygmy rabbits in Nevada. Um, not many people, I hadn't even heard of what a pygmy rabbit was. I didn't know they existed. Yeah. Uh, people know about cottontails and maybe have heard of jackrabbits, but pygmy rabbits, people didn't know about. So there was a lot of information there lacking. So we didn't know um, how long in the year they're active, how long they may not be active, um, what type of foods they eat, things like that. So there's always looking at those questions. Uh, with the armadillos, we didn't know how they moved in the landscape and um, what areas they were in. Like, do they like, you know, um, swamps? Do they like the forest? Do they like open land? A lot of farmers thought they were after their crops, but really they eat bugs um, and they're actually in the woods more. So we found that out. Um, so the big thing is finding what needs studied, endangered species, of species of concern usually, but also just common species. We still are missing a lot of knowledge. So, or things that um, are everywhere that maybe like raccoons, things we know a lot about them, but they're still maybe a nuisance or something. So there's always research with common animals too, not just endangered animals. Yeah. And with everything changing all the time, animals that we knew a fair amount about will change. And then we don't know what they've changed to. It's right. If they end up in a new area, that's something you can look at too. Like I did. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I've got a question from Nay. Uh, what's your favorite part of your job and what's the most dangerous part of your job? Um, my favorite part is not just the animals, but some of the people I've met. Um, people think, oh, I'll go work with animals so I don't have to talk to people. But <laughs> it's a lot of talking to people. Um, I meet a lot of people who are farmers, who are forestry. Um, we work in the forest that do eventually become timber. So we have to work with a lot of different people. 
Um, but I like meeting the people who have the same interests as me or similar stuff. So if I study mammals, but I get to meet somebody who works on birds in the same area, I like to meet those people um, as well as see the animals there and things I didn't know about. Um, the most difficult part or part I don't enjoy or a dangerous part um, is you have to learn the new area. You have to know Oh, if there's grizzlies, you have to be aware of that. If there's venomous snakes, um, which I've even working with the pygmy rabbits, we've caught rattlesnakes almost. So you have to be aware of what's there. Um, but it's relatively safe once you know the area and learn, you know, what to look out for. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, all right. We got two questions that are kind of tied together. One, um, I'll ask them at the same time because I think the answer is kind of going to be similar. Um, what is the first thing you'd say to a student who would like to pursue uh, ecology as a profession? And then the other question is, uh, what degree did you obtain in college? Right. So the first thing I would say to get started is, you know, see what interests you the most. Like I said, I like mammals. Um, some people do multiple taxa. Some people will study how weather or um, storms flooding are affecting multiple things like birds, mammals, reptiles. So you can study multiple taxa, but you need to have a topic like um, you want to study movement, uh, you want to study disease um, in species. Um, so I would say, you know, see what interests you the most. It can always change. Like you can study mammals one year and then you want to study reptiles the next year. It's fine to do that, but just do as much um, studying on the topic as you can with books and the internet. Um, maybe if you are early um, early in your college career or even in high school, see if you can volunteer at a place that works with wildlife, like wildlife uh, rehabilitators or get some experience and see if it's really what you want to do and be around. And then uh, my degree is in environmental science. Um, actually, my undergraduate degree is um, wildlife science and biology. And then my master's is environmental science. So depending on the state um, and the school, it may have a different term, but it's usually related to conservation science, environmental science, or wildlife science or biology. Great. Thanks. All uh, right, our next question is from Isabella at Palm Spring Elementary in fifth grade. Um, have you ever taken any of the animals home to care for them? So we're not allowed to do that. Um, there are people who take animals from the wild and study them in a lab setting because, you know, there's only so much we can do in the wild. We can't study um, their reaction to stress and their um, people may want to study a uh, their heartbeat or something under stress. So they do that in a lab. They study how their hormones change. So that is something people can get approval to do with um, the right protocol and safety and the right setup in a lab, which could be similar to a zoo setup or something. You know, they have to have the right enclosure. But people do that. Um, when I was younger, I did take home a box turtle and think, you know, that's a good thing to do. Um, I just want to study it because I was interested. But now we realize um, we shouldn't do that. Luckily, we did put it back. Um, but the internet nowadays, you should really be careful and see, you know, um, why you shouldn't do that. People think, oh, we know what they like to eat. They're eating worms. But the box turtle needs a much bigger diet and a bigger habitat. <laughs> so um, if you want an animal from a pet store, that's great. But don't take them from the wild. Um, we want to keep them safe and healthy. And we definitely don't know enough about them. So yeah. I did in the past, but now we know. Don't do that. Now we know. <laughs> Live and learn. Awesome. We got a question from Ashley from Bridge Academy in Virginia. Has a llama ever spit on you? No. Uh, well, maybe at like a zoo. <laughs> I haven't seen them in the wild. Um, I know there are some, even national parks here in the U.S. that use alpacas or llamas to carry things on mountain trails. So they are used for things in parks even, but I haven't been around them um, and luckily have not been spit on, but I have been um, pooped on by some reptiles, some snakes, they do that. <laughs> Bunnies even will use the bathroom on you when they're nervous. So animals do that, they'll spit or they'll go to the bathroom when they're nervous. Yeah. But uh, that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool. All right. Henry wants to know, how does an animal's behavior change while in captivity? Does this change depend on whether the animal is a predator or a prey? Absolutely. Um, they do change. Um, so in the wild, I mean, obviously they're going to be their natural selves, but even when we're around them in the wild, we get close to them. They may act different than they normally would be, obviously. Um, so now as biologists, we do a lot of hands-off work. We try to put out cameras and see what they're doing without people around. And then um, in captivity, uh, they're obviously going to change. Uh, we try to like in zoos and things, they'll simulate the natural environment as much as possible. They want them to act as natural as possible, but um, prey is still possibly going to hide um, and predators may be out more. But um, yeah, they, they'll they change a little bit um, even in the wild or in captivity. So when people are around, they're going to act a little different. Yeah. Cool. All right. Our next question is, uh, what kickstarted your interest in pursuing a career in wildlife biology? Um, well, I've been interested in it since I was a kid. Um, I have a picture of me even when I was probably seven or eight with a little net going to look for frogs. <laughs> so it's always been an interest of mine. I didn't know it was a career till halfway through college. I mean, I grew up watching Steve Irwin, um, Wild Thornberries, where the main character talks to animals and thinking, oh, I want to work with animals. Um, but I only thought, you know, the main way to work with animals was like a veterinarian. So um, the first few years of college, I was on the path to become a vet. But then I realized um, I'm not great at chemistry. It's not my strong suit. <laughs> um, and I wanted to be outdoors. And then I found out about wildlife biology. And I was like, oh, I there are vets that do wildlife biology. They go and help biologists like myself, um, but I wanted to do the hands-on work, and um, when I realized, oh, I could go study bats and um, rabbits and things, uh, that really was the turning point. I My first job was working with bats, and I finally got to hold one in my hands and measure it and then release it safely, and I realized this is what I want to do, um, and from there, I've worked with a lot of other animals, but um, yeah, just realizing, oh, that Steve Irwin, that's a job. <laughs> like, that wasn't just for TV. That's a real um, career you can do. And um, some jobs may pay more than others, but it's still very rewarding. Awesome. I think yesterday was Steve Irwin Day. So I didn't know that. I should know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Steve Irwin also was uh, very inspirational to me as a as a youth. I, um, for folks who don't know, I uh, am a squid biologist. So Steve Irwin rules, uh, rest in peace. All right, the next question is from Naomi. Um, we saw in your master's thesis that armadillos can carry leprosy. Are there other animals that can also carry leprosy or other animals that you've studied that were vectors for disease that affect humans? Yes, so armadillos, the nine-banded armadillos are the only ones we have in Tennessee uh, or in the US. Um, but there are other species in South America, and a lot of those um, armadillos can carry leprosy, which can spread to humans. It's uh, skin disease, causes rashes. Um, it can be pretty dangerous, um, but there is a cure for it now, so you can get treated if you get it. Um, we have studied armadillos in Tennessee, and people have done studies in Florida and stuff, and the risk of getting infected is very low. Um, not many of them actually carry it anymore. Um, the most dangerous places are where the humidity is high. So swampy areas, um, they may have more leprosy in those areas. Um, but in Tennessee, we didn't find any. Um, and armadillos and humans are the main two um, animals or um, species that can carry leprosy. So armadillos mainly would give it to people or to other armadillos. It doesn't affect other species. Um, but there have been a few cases of leprosy in chimpanzees and also in European um, red squirrels. So there's just small outbreaks in places, but it is treatable in people. And the main way to avoid it would just be don't touch an armadillo, um, especially if you have open wounds. So just don't mess with wildlife you don't know about and you should be fine. Um, and again, in most places, it's not very common anymore. It used to be a lot more prevalent. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Happy to hear yeah. that for everybody's sake. Um, I still won't 
I promise I won't, I won't pick up any wildlife. That's, that's like, if there's one takeaway, I think from today, it's don't pick up wild animals. Yeah, um, like, I think another question, a part of that question was other species that carry things. So like raccoons, foxes, bats, I worked with bats have rabies. Yeah. Um, so I was vaccinated for that. Um, so if I did come into contact with it, I would be safe. Um, but that is also treatable as long as you're aware of it, as soon as you get bitten by an animal, you don't know. So if something happened and it was an accident, um, but again, don't mess with animals, but if there is an accident, just make sure to go to a doctor right away, get tested for anything. Cause there are wild animals that can carry diseases. So just yeah. be careful. And if you're bitten by an animal that could be a rabies vector, go to the hospital immediately and get uh, rabies treated. Um, <laughs> that I'm also rabies vaccinated and um, I've had a couple friends who have had to get the like whole it's like a whole thing it's a lot of shots uh so to avoid having to get a lot of shots don't pick up wild animals uh the next question is from Ms. Stiles's fourth grade class what's the biggest animal that you have worked with well, the biggest animal would be black bears um I didn't get to do hands-on work but we were studying the DNA and the populations in North Carolina um so what we do is we collect their fur and the fur has their DNA, just like our hair would have our DNA. Um, so we can tell different individuals from each other because everybody's DNA is unique. And so are the bears. <laughs> so we went and we set up these black bear fur snares, which is three trees in the woods. You put barbed wire around it and you hang a little donut in the middle, a little treat. Um, don't feed wildlife unless it's uh, proved. <laughs> um, we just put one donut so they're not hanging out there. Um, but it lures them in. Um, there's a raspberry scent. They love raspberry and honey. They come in from over a mile away because they can smell from really far. And then they leave their fur behind on the barbed wire. And then we collect it. We send it to the lab for DNA testing so we know how many bears were there, um, what time of the year they were there, and how they might be moving around. So there were black bears in the wild. I didn't handle them, but we did see them. Um, Another thing is don't feed wildlife because we had one black bear who didn't want to leave us alone, um, kept following us. It was a young bear, very curious. We had bear spray and we were making loud noises. So eventually it did go away and run off because they're scared of us. They should be scared of us. That's what we want. Um, but it could have been a dangerous situation if that bear smelled the food we had or the scent and came after us. That would be very dangerous. Um, black bears in North Carolina can because they eat a lot of peanuts on the farms, get up to like 700 pounds, which is the size of a, a decent grizzly. That's right. very big black bear because of the corn and the peanuts that people are allowed to leave out there for them. <laughs> so very big animal. Um, but as long as you know bear safety and you have your bear spray and you travel in a group, we were always working in groups, then it was still relatively safe. Nice. Are these like literal donuts that people eat donuts like that? Style? Yes. So we got donations from Duncan and places that um, they were like a day old. So they can't be eaten by people anymore, but we could use them for our bear study and, you know, collect the hair with that. So nice. Love that. All right. The next question is from Claire. What got you into photography? Does it help you in your work? And is there a particular tool you use for that or just a camera phone? Yes, uh, I have a big Nikon camera, I'm not sponsored, um, but I have a very big lens because you don't want to get close to wildlife, um, especially if you want to see what they're naturally doing. You want to keep your distance. Um, you'll see people in national parks that may get too close and that could be very dangerous for them and the animal. So I have a big lens. I zoom in far. Um, I like to take photos just because I want to remember the moment. I want to remember what I saw. Um, especially with birds, I may not be as familiar. So I use the camera to kind of go back later and identify the bird I saw. So if I can get a good photo, I can share it with other biologists or put it on um, an app like iNaturalist. If you haven't heard of that, iNaturalist can help you identify any bug, plant, any animal you see. And that helps biologists too, because when I was studying the armadillos, I could see where they were in Tennessee from people's reports on iNaturalist. Um, so the pho photography helps biologists, it helps me. And then also um, right now, or just recently in Nevada, we were studying the pygmy rabbits and we put collars on them that are maybe the size of a quarter, like very small collars. 
Um, and we would try to find the rabbits uh, by looking at the little um, signal the collar is putting off. We try to get close to them, but obviously, again, not too close and use that lens to see if the collar still looks good on the rabbit. So it helps in our job to be able to photograph the animal, see how it's doing if we are putting collars or things on them. And um, so I use a big camera, but we also use um, camera traps, which are a waterproof, weatherproof camera that we leave at the site, either on a tree or on a post, and we'll put it near an animal's den or a place we know the animal's gonna be. And that's a hands-off way to just view the animals, see what they're doing without being there and waiting forever for the animal. So that's a really cool um, way we can get photos too now. And I, I could actually share the screen and share some photos possibly. Yes, please. Uh, here we go. Share. So let's see, can we see that? Yes. So here are the endangered black-footed ferrets. Um, here's a camera we put out at a burrow. This and... looks like um, a folder full of pictures. Oh, I tried to click it. Is it delayed or did it open? Uh, good question. Let me stop share and then share again. Yeah. <laughs> and share screen. There's the photo. And share. Now can we see the ferret? There. Maybe. I see a ferret. Okay, yeah, two ferrets actually. So we have uh, one standing up uh, and one at the burrow. So we weren't there at that time, but the camera was there and we could see, you know, their activity at night, uh, what time they might come out of their burrow. And because these cameras have a timestamp and a date, so we know when they're active without actually being there bothering them. And see, I have another one here of a weasel with a rabbit whoa um, that weasel killed that rabbit yes yeah, so that is a cottontail um in nevada and the weasel is probably half the size or less and still took down this rabbit so Sorry. um we think of these little animals as you know cute but they are very strong and very good hunters <laughs> so there's some of the camera trap photos cool okay. Uh, all right, next, we got a question from Tracy. How do human activities impact wildlife? And what are the common conflicts that can arise? It's a very good question. Um, so obviously people are spreading. Um, they're moving to new places where they weren't before. We're making trails, roads, um, building new houses. That all affects wildlife. So some animals are more affected than others. So we know raccoons aren't as affected or they learn how to live around people. They've actually become really good at it. They'll get into food bins and things. Um, bears are really good at living with people, um, um, surviving off that and really realizing how that can benefit them. And then there's other animals that aren't as good at um, living around people and they'll avoid people. So as we maybe start using a hiking trail more, the animals are pretty smart. Most species are very smart and they'll learn, oh, people aren't here at night, so I can still come at night. So some animals will just adjust their time, they're active to avoid the people. Um, some animals may not know that. And so you may see them in the daytime or um, just avoid them if you do see them like snakes, they're not gonna know. They're still gonna be out there because it's sunny, they wanna get warm. So they may be on the trail. Um, so in that case, you just wanna walk around it if you can. Um, do not try to move the snake, especially if you don't, if you've never done that, just walk around if you can. Um, birds, birds are great at living. Some of them are really used to living with people. We feed them, so they're fine with us. Um, some birds may avoid people. So I've noticed uh, blue jays and crows, a lot of them either really like people or really avoid people. <laughs> so it just depends even on the individual. So it could be the same species, but some of them don't want to be around people and some do. Um, the main thing is uh, we want to preserve as much habitat as we can. So um, even uh, where we may have to build a, a new building for a school or something, we still want to try to minimize the impact. We try to, a lot of places will try to, you know, leave as many trees and places for wildlife to still exist. So 
people are trying to, you know, coexist and the animals are trying to. <laughs> right. All right. So we had a lot of questions that are like, what's the biggest, smallest, fluffiest? Let's do some rapid fire, like superlatives of the animals you've worked yes. with. Yes. Okay. What's the fluffiest animal you've worked with? Probably those pygmy rabbits in winter. They're active year round and they are just little puff balls in the winter. <laughs> yep. Wonderful. Okay. Biggest animal. We've already said black bear. Black bear. Smallest <laughs> animal you've worked with? Again, uh, probably the pygmy rabbits. So they're about half a pound, very small, smaller than cottontails you see in your yard. So they're like maybe the size of a big uh, baseball. <laughs> uh, biggest reptile you've worked with? Um, Probably snapping turtles. So as an undergraduate, I've got to um, see those and re release some. So big snapping turtles. Great. How many species of snake have you worked with? Well, I haven't worked with any, but I have um, been around a lot at zoos, at schools, um, uh, even with the pygmy rabbits. Sometimes we saw rattlesnakes and uh, gopher snakes and snake um, and worm snakes and things. So I have cool. probably yeah. 40 to 50 <laughs> types of snakes that I've either seen or held or saw in captivity. So cool. Uh, most dangerous. Ooh. Um, Maybe not. Uh, well, the black bear is probably the most dangerous, but just knowing how to be around them. They're actually big babies. If you've uh, listened to the Get Out Alive podcast, which I'm a big fan of, uh, they do a podcast episode about um, an animal attack, and then they teach you how to avoid an attack like that. And the black bears can be dangerous, um, but they're also big babies. So as long as people aren't feeding them, they're still scared of people, they will always run. <laughs> All right. And then here's the last one. What is the meanest animal you've worked with? Um, I had, didn't work with it, but I did come across a badger when I was stuck um, studying the ferrets because they are in the same area and the badger bluff charged me. Um, and I mean, they look pretty cute, um, but I didn't know it was there. It I obviously scared it and it scared me. And I was just looking for prairie dogs and they live in burrows too. And Instead of a prairie dog in the burrow, a badger came out and growled at me and showed its teeth. And I went weak in the knees. I was like, you're small, but that was ferocious. Yeah. There are always these questions like, what's the biggest animal you think you could take? I'm like, and then recently on science Twitter, uh, I think this was yesterday or the day before, people were asking like, what's the smallest animal that's kicked your butt? And I'm like, and the animals were small. A little a little animal can um, do a lot. I run yeah. uh, with, from wild animals best best choice uh okay last one most friendly most friendly animal most friendly um I don't know about friendly um uh, most animals are pretty afraid of people um but most cute and I mean curious would be the ferrets um they don't always run they like to know what you are they haven't seen you they will just keep popping up out of the burrow so they're pretty um just curious which makes them appear friendly <laughs> adorable uh what project are you currently working on um so right now I just finished up the pygmy rabbit work in Nevada and I drove home to Tennessee which was a three-day trip um I don't have anything lined up right now but I'm trying to go back to school to get a PhD and um talking to some different people um advisors possibly uh or um, people who may know somebody just trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. There's someone in North Carolina who is studying how hurricanes or flooding affect a bunch of birds, uh, reptiles, mammals. And so I'm trying to see if we can maybe get that going. We have to get funding, of course, which is very difficult in this field. Um, big animals and game species like deer get a lot of funding, but animals that people don't think of as often are hard to get funding to study, but we're going to try to get a project going. Um, other than that, I might work with the bears again this summer. So we'll see. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, okay. A bunch of people ask basically the same question. Um, and it, that is what are like the biggest problems um, affecting wildlife and environmental issues today? What are the biggest issues? Uh, the big biggest issue would be habitat loss. So again, as we build um, new homes, new buildings that can be, um, I mean, we're clearing a lot of land. Um, some companies will try to clear less land, which is good, or they try to make an old building into something new. Like if a house is abandoned you or just needs remodeling, that helps a lot. Um, 
we have land set aside, national parks, uh, bureau land management, um, other countries obviously have different things, but the U.S. has a lot of um, land reserved for people, and um, that helps a lot, people and animals. And um, another big thing is disease. So people feeding animals, that can spread disease amongst the animals. So you may think it's cute to go put food out for raccoons, but if a lot of them are all coming in the same area, then that disease, if they have rabies, one has rabies or um, distemper, which dogs can get to. Um, so it can put your pets at risk. It can put the raccoons at risk. Um, and then another thing is CWD or chronic wasting disease in deer. So big deer populations um, can spread disease amongst each other. So putting out food even that deer might come to could spread disease to each other if a lot of them are coming to the same base to feed instead of spreading out like they naturally do. Um, so people feeding wildlife for, you know, going on the internet and thinking, oh, this looks cool on the internet. It gets me a lot of views, but it, it could be dangerous to the animals. So if you put out a natural food or you put a camera where the deer are naturally feeding on leaves, that's better than putting out things that um, draw them in more. So a big thing is the internet, people using animals for fame, <laughs> wild animals. If you use your pets, that's fine. <laughs> um, using wild animals for fame, um, which can spread disease and get you hurt as well if you're hand feeding them. And just habitat loss. So when we build new stuff, when we could be reusing old buildings or something, so. Great, thanks. Um, our next question is, if you had all the funding that you wanted and you could work with one animal that you haven't gotten to yet, what would your like go-to animal be? Um, probably river otters and mink. So um, the project I'm trying to get started uh, with this advisor in North Carolina is it might involve mink or river otters there because they're affected by the flooding um, at the coast. So we might get to do that. I also think it would just be neat to um, study these animals that are, it's a mammal, but it's in the river. So a lot of people study marine mammals. So they study the seals, um, um, sea otters and things, but I wanna study the river otters in freshwater um, and just see how they, they move very quickly in different uh, rivers, like faster than you would think. So they move around a lot. I would like to study how they move and what they eat in different locations. <laughs> That sounds fun. Um, our next question is from Lila. How do you stay up to date on ecological news and research? Um, a lot of it is Twitter, which is how you found me. I'm always um, seeing other biologists post their recent work, their papers, um, what they wanna do or what they just finished doing. And I also will um, read their scientific papers. So people like me will do the research like I did my armadillo research we submit it to a journal, a scientific journal, and then that will get reviewed by other scientists to make sure that the research is sound, it's good, um, it's, you know, we don't have any gaps in the knowledge or anything. It's as good as it can be before it gets published. So it's, it's not just science that's published, it's science that is reviewed and then published. So we know it's very accurate and there are a bunch of journals. There's journal journals of mammalogy, of um, you know, herpetology, um, disease, wildlife disease journals. There's all kinds of journals out there. And a lot of it um, is free for anyone to go look at. So if you go to scholar.google.com and search the animal or um, anything you're interested in, a disease, a bacteria, even you study or you type in that and you'll find all kinds of papers. <laughs> Great. Uh, our next question is from Lori. Uh, do you get to travel a lot for your job? Yes. So um, as I mentioned, I'm in Tennessee now, but I just came back from Nevada. And that was 2,000 miles away. <laughs> um, uh, and then I've done work in North Carolina. I've done work in Wyoming. Um, so not everybody wants to travel in this field. Some people will want to um, stay in one area, and that's perfectly good, too. You can become really really knowledgeable about that area and the species there. Um, but just being uh, early in my career, I've done a lot of traveling to just get good experience with different types of species. So in Wyoming, I worked with the black-footed ferret. 
in Nevada, the pygmy rabbits. Um, in Tennessee, I worked with armadillos and bats. And then in North Carolina, the black bear. So I've traveled a bit. Um, I may, you know, stay put for a little while soon and just focus on one species for a few years just because it, it does get tiring. It's, you have to leave your family. I had to leave my pet behind my dog because I can't just take her everywhere um, if I don't have somebody to watch her. So mm. it's it's rough. It's fun for a while, but it's good to have a balance. Like sometimes you just want to take a break and um, stay in one spot for a few years, <laughs> which is also possible. Um. All right. Chloe from fourth grade wants to know, are you able to tell right away if an animal that you encounter has rabies? No, that's the scary thing. So um, there are some signs if an animal has it and it's had it for a while, it may act funny. Um, it may have foam at the mouth, but if it doesn't have that, it could still have rabies. So um, people think, oh, they see something like a raccoon in the daytime, it has rabies. That's not always true. So it could or it couldn't. Uh, it may just be a mama raccoon who has babies she's trying to find food for. So she may just be out in the day because she needs food, not because she has rabies. But it could also be a fox or something that's that does have rabies or a raccoon. So um, the safe thing is just to watch it from a distance. Um, if you do see signs of rabies, like foam at the mouth or something, you can call um, a vet or a wildlife biologist. Um, every state here in America has their wildlife agency. So Tennessee has Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. Um, Wyoming has Wyoming Game and Fish. There's a wildlife agency in every state. So you would call them and see what they can do. They will come take care of it um, the best way they can. Great. Um, all right, Ruthie's got a follow-up, something you were just explaining. How does feeding the animals give them diseases? Are the humans the vectors? Is the food? Um, and does being a vegetarian help wildlife? Oh, it's a lot. <laughs> a lot of so um, people aren't really spreading the disease to the animals. Uh, we can get diseases from them. Um, and putting food out brings a lot of animals into one spot. So if the animals are naturally going and looking, like if a raccoon is going and looking for fruits, for um, meat to eat, they're going to spread out usually. Like they they might be close to each other, but not as close as like someone putting out a bowl of food. So the saliva and stuff on the food bowl can spread to another animal or if they're just at the same food bowl and they end up having a little fight or something, they could spread disease that way. Um, also... Oh, uh, sorry. What was the other parts of the question? It was. Uh, is being a vegetarian helpful for a while? Ah, yes. So, yes and no. It just depends. So if someone were eating less meat or no meat at all, then maybe that means we may not have as many cattle fields. So that would um, help wildlife because we didn't have to clear the land for cattle. Um, but then again, in some places, the cattle are going to be there regardless, so it might not. Um, it just depends where you're getting your food, basically. So actually, vegetarians or um, people who are eating a lot of vegetables, that cropland is taking a lot of space, too, and taking away habitat. But if you're, you know, growing your own, that can be the most helpful thing, buying local and not supporting, like, big corporations. So um, going to local farm markets and getting either vegetables or meat there could be better than supporting bigger companies. That's the main thing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we are coming up on time here. So we always ask everybody the same two questions at the end of every session. The first question is if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one thing about your area of expertise, what would that be? Gosh, um, Go out and see the animals, like go outside and just see what's around you, get some books and learn what's about around you. Cause a lot of people don't know and there's so many cool things. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, your second question is, you still have everybody's attention in the whole world and you can tell them one thing about anything. It could be um, serious and significant or silly and fun. It can be whatever you want. It doesn't have to be related to anything. I don't know. <laughs> Um, man, that's a tough one. Top question. I've yeah. thought of this. <laughs> uh, about anything? Anything you want? 
um, travel if you can, whether you like wildlife or not, like travel if possible. Like, uh, I know a lot of people in my area just stay in the same town and that's fine too, but like try to try to travel, try to meet new people and get their perspectives from as many places as you can. Awesome. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share before we say goodbye for the day? I got nothing, but uh, you can email me at mustelidmay at gmail.com. I can put it in the chat maybe, but uh, any other questions that I get didn't get to, you can email me or, or follow me at mustelidmay on Twitter or Instagram. Yeah, because awesome. I know there are probably a lot of questions I didn't get to. We're trying to get through as many questions as we possibly could, but it's it's always really hard. Um, and keep in mind, folks, uh, if you want to have a session just for your group where you can answer every single question that your group has, we can match you with a scientist. That's what we're here for. So feel free to sign up for a session. Um, we match every single Thursday uh, at skypescientist.com. Click uh, sign up and then you can get yourself signed up. We'll be doing a match tonight. Um Otherwise, other housekeeping, um, we are going to have another one of these on December 13th, I believe. That one's going to be on physics. Um, should be good. And if you want a topic covered in one of these sessions next semester, we're going to start planning those soon. So feel free to shoot me an email, uh, sarah at skypeascientist.com. Um, we'll work on getting those scheduled. Um, what else is going on? That's really it. We got crab facts calendars to help support our program so we can pay for uh, honoraria for our scientists and pay for uh, our ASL interpretation and all sorts of stuff. Um, these are, you scratch off the little sparkles and you get a crab facts, pretty sweet. You can get those um, at uh, squidfacts.bigcartel.com. I can put that in the link. It's also, it's also a link um, on our website. Um, da, 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 there we go. My I partner think... studies crabs, so I might have to get him one. Gotta get one. The crab... He might know the things, but he might not know. <laughs> we'll we really see. dug deep. We uh really <laughs> dug deep on those crab facts. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge with us. This has been really cool. I've learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Jasmine, for signing. We really, really appreciate you being here. Um, and we'll see you all soon. Hey, thank you all. Bye.